Well, good morning. Welcome to St. James. Welcome if you are in the house this morning. Welcome if you are visiting us online. It's great that you're connecting with us, whether you're connecting on Facebook or YouTube or whatever social platform, you are more than welcome to be with us this morning. Hasn't it been an amazing week? You know, as we, we think about the, the, the Christian um, calendar, you know, I think this is one of the amazing weeks where we think about Jesus going back to heaven. And for myself, it was really good on Thursday. There was all sorts of stuff going on. Um, nine o'clock in the morning, I had the privilege of going down to um, St. James's School. I've not been down to school for quite a few months. I've been uh, doing assemblies online. Uh, but this last week, it was just amazing that I could meet with all the children and, and, and all the staff. Uh, we met outside. We had an uh, Ascension Day service thinking about the time when uh, Jesus uh, was leaving his friends once again, a sad time for them, but with a lot to look forward to, to the future. And, and just thinking about our own lives as that happens, isn't it? You know, we, we go through transition, different things happen to us, and, um, but there's exciting stuff on the horizons. And then obviously meeting here um, at the Bell Chapel, at seven o'clock in the evening on Thursday and then life group afterwards and oh, just, just so much stuff going on in the life of the church at the moment. And it's really great that everybody's here and uh, wanting to worship this morning. And that's what we've come together for this morning, isn't it? To worship our one and true almighty creator God. Should, so, should we just stand together as we, come to, uh, as we come together this morning? Let's just stand. I just want to pray for us, pray thanks for this day, and then we're going to worship. So, Lord, I just thank you. You know, we're in awe of you. We love you. We just, we just thank you that we can be together, be it in person or online. We just thank you, Lord. We just want to sing your praises this morning, Lord. We want to sing with our hearts. We want to sing with our minds. We just want to sing your praises, Lord. Thank you for all that you do in our lives. And we pray in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Let my soul rise up to meet you as the day
Well, good morning. Uh, Great to be here once again, uh, talking into our sermon series, Life in Six Words. And, uh, you know, this morning, I don't think I'm going to talk for as long as I normally talk, because um, I think we need a little bit of reflection time at the end. So, um, yeah, I do. So, uh, you know, today, as we, um, once again, in this sermon series, Life in Six Words, uh, we're at the third word. So we're uh, sort of halfway through, almost halfway through um, the series. And uh, Mavis last week talked about our, our sin. She said that she thought that she'd got the short straw. And, um, but if we're talking about short straws, then this week I'm going to be talking um, about sin. And I know Mavis touched on it last week. Um, I'm going to go a little bit deeper this week. And um, I'm going to try and unpack a couple of things that there might be a a few misconceptions about. And let's just see where we go. But before we start, shall we pray? Father, we just thank you again for this opportunity that we have of meeting together. Whether we're meeting online online or whether we meet in in person, we are meeting together. And we just thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for the privileges that we have in our life. And we pray, Lord, that today that you will just speak to us um, through your Holy Spirit. So send your Holy Spirit to be with us, Lord, to guide us and to teach us and to open our hearts into the way that you want to live our lives. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I think over the last couple of weeks, I've been asking lots of questions. So I've got another question for you today. It's not a question about your sin, so don't be troubled there. But have you ever been lost? Have you ever been lost? And and I suppose there's got to have been times in your life when you've been lost. How many of you, either as an adult or as a child, has been to a maze? Yep quite a number of you 
Um, how many people have been to the Maze Maze in York? I know Kevin's been to the Maze Maze, but yeah, a couple of others. Huge big place, um, changes every year, so you're not going to learn it as such. Um, but it can be quite daunting, can't it? When you've been in there for an hour or so, and you feel like there's no way out. I often wonder what's going to happen at the end of the day. You know, do they, do they just leave people in there, or do they come and get you? So I would have hoped that they would come and get you. Anyway, um, what about being um, in somewhere like a subway? You know, like the London Underground. I remember being on the London Underground a few years ago. Me and Michelle had gone down for a couple of days, and it felt so claustrophobic just to be in the, in the underground station with all those people crammed in there. I just wanted to escape. And it feels, you know, that the, the tube arrives and you get on the tube and if it's an empty carriage, it feels like you've escaped. You know, escaped from the mad rush, but that's not normally how it is. Normally all the people from the platform just pile onto the tube and, and it's as bad on there as it was on the station platform. Or have you ever been in a shopping center you know, we have lots and lots of huge big shopping centers now. And um, quite often I'm overwhelmed with the amount of people are, you know, post-COVID, you know, in, in the times when there was lots and lots of people around in our shopping centers. Um, I remember being in Meadowhall a number of years ago and just so overwhelmed with all the people in there that I just felt I needed to go into a store and, you know, it was amazing when I went in, it was, it was a quiet store. It was a department store, but there were areas where it was quiet and it felt like a refuge. It felt like somewhere where you could go and gain a little bit of refuge. I think that's how we should feel about sin. You know, I don't want to upset you, but it's not really like the tube or the underground or the maze because there's no escape from sin. And Mavis touched on a point last week, and she said that it's our sins that separate us from God. And how true is that? Our sins do separate us from God. And our sins cannot be removed by the things that we do which are good. So it's not like a set of scales, you know, like the justice scales where you put one thing on one side and something outweighs it on the other. It's, you know, it doesn't matter what good works we do. If we're doing bad works, then those good works are not going to bring up the, the scales, as it were. Sounds like there's no way out. Sounds like there's no way out of the maze. There's no way out of the subway. There's no way out of the shopping center. There's no way out of this place that we call sin. Today, I want to talk about how sin can't be removed by our good works. In other words, there's no escape from it in our own power. It's interesting, you know, a couple of days ago on Thursday, I was in school for the first time for a while. I uh, went to do assembly. It was Ascension Day, as you know. Um, it was a bit of a wet day, but first thing in the morning, it was absolutely uh, brilliant weather. We managed to do the assembly outside, and, um, and I was talking to the children about how Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit, and that's what we're thinking about in this period of time right now as we're thinking about thy kingdom come, about God's kingdom coming on earth, and what will that look like? We pray for it now. You know, we live in this now and not yet place, but I do pray for his kingdom to come daily and show us his presence in our daily lives. You know, last week, as Mavis touched on our sin, she said, yes, it's the thing that separates us from God. And this week, do you know what? the news doesn't get any better, I'm afraid. It is that sin that separates us from God. And there's no amount of good works that's going to put that right. So where do we go from here, you might say? You know, I don't want to sound all gloom and doom this morning. And I want to give you a little bit of, or a few pointers that could point us in the right direction. 
escape from the ultimate subway or escape from the ultimate shopping center of the things that we want to do, aren't we, when we're thinking about sin. This is what Paul writes in the book of Ephesians, uh, chapter 2. He says, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. It's by grace that we've been saved. Not by good works, by faith that we've, and grace that we've been saved. And this is not from yourselves, but it's a gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. Now, I'm not saying that we should sit back and do nothing. But what I am saying is that we should be doing things for the right reasons. You know, over the last few weeks, our life groups have been looking at the whole question of heaven. You know, what is heaven? What will it be like? I think about what Paul says, and Paul says, but, you know, it doesn't matter what heaven is like, but just think about this. Think about, you know, there'll be nobody in heaven who's boasting about how they got there because we can only get there through His grace and our faith in God. It's uh, the third week, isn't it, where we have been in this series, Life in Six Words. And, uh, you know, for the last couple of weeks, we've had three sermon points. It might sound a little bit old-fashioned. That's how it used to be um, years gone by. But that's what we've been doing over the last couple of weeks. And to be quite honest, that's what I'm going to do today. Um, So my first point is this, that under our own steam, we could never be good enough to enter into God's presence. Under our own steam, we could never be good enough to enter into God's presence. You know, those of you who are in life groups, you'll have been tracking along with a book entitled, Heaven Finding Our True Home. And we would hope, wouldn't we? we it's what we, we long for as we escape this world and, and arrive in another world. It's what we long for, for finding a true home in heaven. And in that book, it asks loads and loads of questions. And I must admit that some people are finding it really good and intuitive and, and um, really exciting. Other people are struggling with it a little bit and, and asking their own questions like, does it really matter what heaven is like? You know, once we get there, does it really matter? Once we are worshiping our almighty God in his presence, does it really matter what it is like. But it does beg questions, doesn't it? And we do continue to ask those questions. This is what Paul writes in Revelation 21. He says, Nothing impure will enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. You know, our attempts to get to heaven under our own steam, under our own merits, could be like compared with long jump in the Grand Canyon or trying to like pole vault to the moon. And you might say, well, them are absolutely ridiculous things. You could never do those. You know, no matter how hard you try, you are never going to be able to pole vault to the moon. You are never going to be able to jump the Grand Canyon we're always going to fall short. And that's what I'm saying. You know, under our own steam, we're never going to be able to get there. It's only by God's grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. You know, Christ came to the world to die for each and every one of us, to redeem us and to take us into himself. So not in our own strength, but by the strength of the Holy Spirit. Let me try to give you an example. Just have a look at this cake. Looks absolutely amazing, doesn't it? I must say, it's not my handiwork. Um, It looks absolutely wonderful on the outside. But what's it like on the inside? You know, this cake could be really burned and awful and taste absolutely disgusting on the inside. But on the outside looks absolutely wonderful. Great fondant, great artwork, looks absolutely wonderful. But when you cut into it, 
when you taste it, it leaves a bitter taste in your mouth. And this is just like ourselves. You know, what's going on on the inside? It was interesting, wasn't it, that some people asked Jesus about his disciples and said to him, you know, why don't your disciples wash their hands? And he says, does it really matter about the dirty hands? He said, because what really matters is what's going on on the inside. You know, we can sugarcoat anything that we do. We can look like the really best people in the world, but what's going on on the inside? My second point this morning is this, that the law is a mirror and not a ladder. The law is a mirror and not a ladder. Let me try to explain this one. I wonder how many of you have ever fallen off a ladder or even a step ladder. You know, even the smallest of step ladders. I fell off a step ladder here in church about two years ago during the Christmas tree festival. It was quite a high, tall step ladder. I was on the top run, should not have been there. Everybody was, uh, was in Hebrews, I think, gone for a coffee and I'm, you know, altering a few lights. And um, I fell off fell right into the Bronte display. That's falling off a ladder. About 25 a year, years ago, I fell off a proper ladder, you know, an extension ladder, one Christmas. Again, it, all these things seem to happen to me about that time. I think it's a time when I'm busy and not concentrating on, on what I should be concentrating on, trying to rush around. Fell off this ladder 25 years ago, broke my arm, you know, did my back in, couldn't get up for five minutes after I fell on the floor outside this building. Those are examples of physically falling off ladders. But you know, mentally, I think that we fall off ladders every week. We, call, we fall off the ladder of the law. Paul says this in Romans 3. He says, therefore no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. But through the law, we become conscious of our sin. I'll just read that again. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. But through the law, we become conscious of our sin. Someone put it this way. You know, you wake up in the morning... I don't know how you feel in the morning. Some, some mornings I feel absolutely wonderful. Other mornings I think, oh, you know, it's morning. I've got to get up. And you stagger off to the bathroom, and I don't know whether you do this or not, but do you look in the mirror? Perhaps you don't. It might be the best option. But, you know, we look in the mirror, and what do we see? We see somebody that is tired, unshaven, you know, air growing out of, places where her shouldn't grow, a matted head of her, and I must say that doesn't happen to me anymore, so I'm obviously thankful for that. But that's what the mirror shows us, isn't it? The mirror shows us who we are. It's a reflection of who we are. And it might be that you take the mirror down and you try to clean it, and then you, you try to wash your face by the mirror. It might be that you clean your teeth by the mirror. You have a shave by the mirror, but it doesn't work. You see, the mirror only shows up the mess. It doesn't fix the mess. It's ourselves that need to fix the mess. We need to get a grip with what's going on in life. Jesus said, I've not come to overthrow the law, but I've come to fulfill it. You see, the law exposes how messed up we are but we're actually cleaned up, we're actually saved, we're actually transformed through His grace. So the law was never meant to actually save anyone in the first place. Let me just tell you the story of the rich young ruler that we find in Matthew 19. I'm sure a number of you probably know this um, passage, quite familiar passage to you. Some of you may not have even read this ever before, but uh, this is a story that we find in there, and at verse 16 it says this, 
a man came to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to gain eternal life? What, must, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask? What is good? Jesus replied. There's only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep your commandments. Which ones? He inquired. And Jesus replied, You shall not uh, murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your mother and your father, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, how easy are those things to do? All of these things I have kept, the young man said. What do I still like? Jesus answered, If you want to be perfect, then go, sell your possessions, and give it to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. And then he said, Come and follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. And then Jesus turned around and he talked to his disciples and he said this, he said, Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, who then can be saved? You know, who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Just think about that. You know, think about those long jumping things I was saying earlier on, you know, pole vaulting uh, to the moon. It's impossible under our own statement. And this is what he's saying here. With man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. You know, Jesus wasn't saying that he could be saved by good deeds. He, he wasn't saying that. And I think a lot of people misunderstand this passage about, you know, giving everything that we've got to those in need. Jesus was just highlighting the fact of what the problem was with the rich young ruler. And the problem was that he needed forgiveness and he needed to be shown what was wrong in his life. Jesus pulled out a mirror and he showed that young ruler his heart. In his conversation with Jesus, the rich young ruler implied that he was able to meet all the perfect laws of God. And you know, none of us, not you, nor me, nor the rich young ruler, none of us are able to do that. Jesus was showing him his sins and his need for a saviour. And I think that's what he's showing us too, our sins and our need for a saviour. You know, before we can respond appropriately to God's call, we need to realize how and why we are saved in the first place. You know, last week I went to the dentist, um, and you might think, oh, not, not a very pleasurable thing to go and do. I was only going to get my teeth clean, so it was okay. It was... Uh, there were no drilling took place, I must say. It was really good. And, you know, I don't know about your dentist, but some dentists use sort of a, a dye that you put in your mouth and it exposes the parts in your mouth or the parts of your teeth that are not clean. And, um, and once you've had that in your mouth for a, a very short while, the dentist gives you a mirror and lets you look for yourself. You know, the dye doesn't lie. And in the eyes of the dentist, you become the sinner, don't you? And how does that make you feel? You know, you just want to keep your mouth closed. You don't want the dentist to see it. But you know, the dentist is going to see it. God can see our sins. I remember last week, Mavis talked about, um, you know, CCTV. 
And how some people complain about CCTV and then some people said, well, I've had CCTV all my life because God is like that CCTV, seeing all our imperfections. The dentist is seeing how we are not cleaning our teeth. He's seeing our, our faults. We become the sinner. We are the sinners, aren't we? I just want to jump back to that verse that we found at um, verse 17. When the rich young ruler was talking to Jesus, and, um, and he said, how do I inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, didn't he, at verse 17, he said, if you want to enter life, keep the commandments. And that really wasn't the question that the rich young ruler was asking because the rich young ruler was saying, how do I gain eternal life? Thinking about when he'd died in this world and was going to move on to the next, how would he gain eternal life in that place in heaven? But that's not what Jesus answers. Jesus answers him by saying, if you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Jesus is talking about the now and also the not yet. You know, we pray that prayer, don't we? Over and over again, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And we pray that for today as well as tomorrow. And Jesus is on that same sheet of music. This is what Jesus is saying. If we want to live life and live it to the full in his kingdom here right now on earth, we need to be doing the things that he says. If we want to enter life, keep my commandments, not just for the future, but for the life that we're leading right now. In Matthew 5, Jesus makes it pretty clear because he says this, doesn't he? He says, don't commit adultery. And you might say, but I've not committed adultery. But what's going on in here? What's going on in the mind when you see certain people? Are you committing that sin in your mind? Jesus also says, do not murder. How many people have you murdered with your mind? You know, not physically, but mentally. And then he says, love your friends, but also love your enemies. I know we love our friends. But what about the enemies? What about the people that have done wrong to us? Can we, can we love them? But this is what Jesus is asking us to do. Love your enemies as you love your friends. You know, as we pray that Lord's Prayer every week, and it might be that you pray the Lord's Prayer every day, we ask for something. We ask for our sins to be forgiven. And that's a big ask, isn't it? You know, Lord, will you just forgive me of my sins? But we don't ask for it in that context. We ask for our sins to be forgiven as we forgive those who sin against us. And when we add that caveat, that makes it all so different, doesn't it? So just think about this. You know, when you are asking for your sins to be forgiven, have you forgiven all those people around you who you're thinking, I could never forgive them? He says, be perfect as your Father is perfect in heaven. So the law is like a mirror, isn't it? Showing up our imperfections each and every day. Okay, my final third point that I want to make this morning. Even our good deeds come from selfish motives. Even our good deeds come from selfish motives. Just think about that one for a moment. You know, the things that we do, are we doing it because we want to do it? Or are we doing it because we think it's the right thing to do? You know, God just won't judge us for our actions. He'll judge us for everything. According to Matthew 5, He'll judge us for our thoughts. According to 1 Corinthians, He'll judge our motives. According to Matthew 12, he'll judge the words that come out of our mouths. And according to Revelation 20, he will judge our actions. 
You know, when it comes to believing, receiving, and sharing the good news of Jesus, the idea that sins can be removed by good deeds sets Christianity apart from every other religion. Because other religions feel that that is the case, that sins can be removed by good works. But we say, no, they can't. Most religions agree that there is a problem with humanity and we need to do something about it. We need to fix it. The problem needs fixing up. The difference is, how do we fix the problem in our humanity? In Mormonism, it's the laws and the covenants. In Hinduism, salvation is achieved in one of three ways, either by works or by knowledge or by devotion. In Buddhism, it's the four noble truths. In Islam, it's the five pillars. You see, there's like a ladder to heaven, isn't there, in all these world religions except Christianity. Because Christianity doesn't offer a ladder, but it offers a cross. And it's the cross that makes the difference. It's the cross on which Jesus died that makes the difference. The solution to our sins is not trying, but it's trusting. And we need to do that every day. We need to continue to trust in Jesus because he is the one who is eventually going to save us. And it starts by stop trying to save ourselves, doesn't it? Let's allow Jesus to save us. So if you're a doubter, can I encourage you just to put your faith in Jesus? For those of you who are believers, you know, it's the same faith that sanctifies us. The same faith that we decided on when we decided to follow Jesus as our Savior. Savior, the one that saves us. And out of that sanctification should come good works. You see, it's, it's one way around and not the other. And I think that we should refuse to be legalistic when we try to gain favor with God or try to impress Him by what we do or by what we don't do. You know, that's being legalistic without regard for the condition of our own hearts before God. That's legalism. Legalism is when we take the grace of God that's offered us for free and we add a fee. You know, we add a price tag to it. You know, the only way to please God and produce good works is by relying not on ourselves, but relying on the Holy Spirit. Because it's the Holy Spirit is going to lead us to do the things that the Holy Spirit wants us to do. It's pointless to do things in our own strength. It's pointless to go off on a tangent and just try to do these things that we think are the right things to do. We should be listening to what God is asking us to do and co-laboring with Him. I want to finish with that passage again from Ephesians. Ephesians 2. Let's just remind ourselves of what Paul says. Because he says, For it is by grace that you have been saved by faith, and not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works that anyone can boast. For we are God's handy, we're created in Jesus Christ to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. So, the message is that we need to connect with God and we need to find out what God is wanting us to do. But don't beat yourself up about it. It's the meaning of life, isn't it? And quite often people are, you know, searching for the meaning of life. Some people call it a midlife crisis, don't they? When somebody's, you know, the penny drops and somebody says, I really need to find out the meaning of life. And for the last couple of weeks, we've talked about films, haven't we? Um, Braveheart was the one I talked about a couple of weeks ago. 
and uh, and Pam the week before that she she talked about a particular film and uh, films make you think about things don't they anybody uh, see that film uh, quite a whole film now City Slickers do you remember uh, Billy Crystal as Mitch a bit of a baby boomer uh, cattle drive in search of a uh, in search of the meaning of life and who was the other character in that film Jack Palance yes Jack Palance and Jack Palance realizes that Mitch is is on that road trip for a particular reason and he confronts him about that reason and um and there's a lot of conversation goes on and uh, Mitch asses Jack Palance he says what's the meaning of life what's the meaning of life and Jack Palance says the meaning of life is this and Mitch says to him what do you mean this is the meaning of life and he says it's the one thing this is the meaning of life the one thing so Mitch says well if you know what the one thing is then why don't you tell me what's the one thing in your life that is your meaning of life and Mitch thought he was going to find the answer and Jack Palance says that's for you to find out the meaning of your life is for you to find out is that deep theology love it when we see things like that in films Jack Palance was the most unlikely angel that you could find but the one that is pointing Mitch to the true meaning of life and we have got to work that out for ourselves in our relationship with God the one thing what's your one thing that you think is most important today what is the one thing that God created you for and you might be thinking about all these different things that you should be doing all these works that you should be doing but the one thing that is most important is your relationship with him your relationship with god is the one thing the most important thing that is god's on god's heart right now so let's pray father god we love you we adore you and we praise you and we just thank you for the opportunity that we've had today to come together as a community and we realize lord that the one thing in our lives that is the most important thing is our relationship with you so we pray for our relationship lord we pray for a deeper relationship we pray that we just pray that we can we can connect with you on a different level on a deeper and more meaningful level than we've ever had before so we pray lord today that you come by the power of your holy spirit and you fill us afresh that you guide us into new realms of relationship so teach us today lord and continue to teach us in the days the weeks and the months to come in jesus name amen shana banane shana shana banana banana shaka dibi dipa dia duta kan dia da pa
<laughs> As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. No matter what men bring to me. Oh, shut up by your numbers. Oh, can we begin to have koinonia tonight? Can we begin to have koinonia tonight? Can I hear people tonight who want to speak mysteries? Oh, 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 oh,